Welcome to the Live Full Work Fun Podcast. This is the show to encourage you to live your life to the fullest and do fun work that fuels your lifestyle. Hi, I'm your host, Gayla Scrivener. Every week, you'll be introduced to amazing guests, useful resources, and inspirational stories. You'll discover opportunities and perspectives to shape your version of living full and working fun. Hi there, and welcome to today's show. You know, several years ago, when I was a member of a networking group local to Springfield, Missouri, I had met some amazing people doing some pretty cool things. And today's guest is no exception. She's pretty amazing. Dana Alt is a well-established writer, editor, and author. Her articles appear in many parenting, religious, and literary journals, newsletters, and best-of compilations, all penned while parenting her eight children. Her children's book, Benjamin's Coin Purse, was published by Rod and Steph Publishers in 2001. Several children later, she began a nonprofit organization to support her magazine, The Missouri Autism Report. She wrote edited, and published the magazine, supported by autism organizations Missouri-wide for seven years. Now, with an empty nest looming, she has launched herself into writing Christian books with historical and spiritual value for all ages. Dana's desire is to leave a legacy, which points unabashedly to Christ. Dana serves as a city alderwoman and spends every spare moment writing and building her platform for her upcoming books. Dana is a Christian writer who resides in a small town in Missouri with her husband, youngest son, and a very needy American Eskimo. Today, you'll hear Dana's inspiring story of always continuing her dream of writing through her challenges of her life. Out of necessity of suddenly being a single mother, she used her writing talents to grow a little newsletter into a successful magazine. Now, at a different season of her life, she's going all in for her true passion of being a full-time published author. Let's get right to the conversation, shall we? Well, welcome, Dana. I am so glad that you're here. I am so glad to be here, Gayla. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. It's been a long time since we've seen each other. And in the intro of the show, I gave you guys out there listening a quick bio about Dana. But I have to say to you, Dana, wow, eight kids, eight (laughs) kids. How'd you do that? It's my claim to fame. I had to do something, you know, to stand out. (laughs) Well, that would do it coming from I'm a mother of one. And then I think, oh, my gosh. Hey. <laughs> well, and and I have spent a lot of time raising children, yet I can say that my journey has been so rich. Um, I, I, there was a lady that I met years ago. It's when I just had like one child and she had these two kids. They were both miracle children. She wasn't supposed to be able to have children at all. And I mean, they were just little balls fire. They were into stuff all the time, flooding the bathroom and just, you know, one thing after another. And she would come in and tell us these stories at the church nursery. And we would just be dying, rolling in the floor, laughing with her stories. And she said one day, these boys are going to make me rich someday. And of course, me being the writer, the first thing I thought of was, yeah, she's going to write a book. So I guess in a way, I feel like eight children has prepared me for what I'm doing now, which is writing a book. Well, you've been writing a long, long time. I have actually. In fact, that's all I really wanted to do. I wanted to write. I didn't really, it was not in my plan to get married and have eight children. It was my plan to go to college and get my journalism degree or creative writing degree and go on from there. But the beauty of writing is there is a lot of education you can get online. I do online courses all the time on writing. And you don't necessarily have to have a degree to write a good book if you learn the craft of writing. So it's something that that can be learned. I read on your website that after child number eight, that you went through an unexpected divorce. How did you transition and what what did you do being a, a single mom of eight? 
that was um, probably one of the most difficult times of my life. It, it was one of those things where I, I spent an entire year just grabbing hold of God and saying, don't let go of me. Whatever you do, don't let go of me because I don't know how to handle this. And nobody around me in my group of friends had been through a divorce. I had a sister that had been through a divorce, but beyond that, you know, none of my church friends, nobody. And we were kind of shunned and set aside for various reasons, you know, because of the divorce. And so it was just, it was a very tough time. And then I went through a, a struggle spiritually. I went through a very bad spiritual struggle for about five years. And when I came through on the other side of that, I have to say I came through stronger And with all of my doubting that God could carry me through this, he showed me that he could carry me through this. And so when I came through on the other side, I had gotten rid of a lot of things that were unnecessary in my life and learned to hold on to those things that are very important. So it was a learning experience. It was difficult, but you know, if something doesn't, isn't difficult, you're not going to grow. I learned that these things come our way. We it's, it's what we do with it. Are we going to grow through it or are we going to fall? So that that took me a little while to learn. I survived. I'm still here. (laughs) You and I met through networking opportunities during your work with Missouri Autism Report. And you really took that concept from like a little pea, just blossom tremendously. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes, I can. It was after the divorce and I needed some income coming in. And so I I decide, I, you know, it was one of those things where I say, okay, what do I have in my hands? What am I able to do? My children had a lot of health issues, so I really could not easily work away from home. I did some of that. I worked for a newspaper for a while, but I really needed to come home, be with the kids. And so I started trying to figure out, you know, what can I do? I decided to either do kind of what you're doing, only just the newsletter portion, um, create and send out newsletters for businesses. The other option was something along the lines of a magazine, but it hadn't completely formated in my mind yet. I'm not sure that's the right word, but um, I actually had written an article on about autism, about the uh, insurance mandate. And a lot of the people in the autism community had read that. They began calling me the autism writer. I didn't know anything about this. But then I ran into one of the ladies that I had interviewed and she said, oh, aren't you the autism writer? And I'm like, I don't know. Am I the autism writer? And she had a newsletter that she had been sending out. It was just an email that she sent out. And she had about 500 people on that newsletter list. And she said, my husband says I have to work full time. I can't do this and that too. So would you take it and do something with it? And so uh, we started turning it into a newsletter like you would think in your mind, you know, with pictures and everything and sending it out that way for just a few months. And by then we had enough supporters that we could go uh, magazine. We were printing like 1500, 2000 magazines and distributing them all over the state of Missouri. It just blew up and went great guns. And I did that for seven years and I was so blessed. I, I learned a lot through that, kind of honed my skills. Publishing a magazine, how often were you publishing? Um, I was publishing monthly. Yeah, that's a big job. Yeah. The last year I went like every other month as I was kind of uh, starting to wind it down. I, I just kind of felt like, okay, this is something I need to do. And I began to wind it down. So we did every other month, I think for the last year and then, and then closed it. What got you started writing about autism? It was that crazy article that I that I did in the newspaper. Actually, I have a child that was diagnosed with autism. He doesn't like anybody to know that, so I can't tell you who he is. But 
<laughs> he no longer would qualify with any type of autism. He he did so well, and he is just an amazing, amazing person with some amazing skills. But when he was very young, he had an autism diagnosis. And so we had been dealing with that already on our own. So I had that connection as well as I went into writing the magazine. But really, everything I learned, I learned from the people around me. The beauty of it was I was surrounded by people that knew new autism. So many of my articles, I would either interview someone or I would just call them on the phone and say, hey, would you send me an article about this or that? And then a lot of times they would call me and say, hey, we've got this going on. Will you run an article? And so we filled up pretty quick every month. Well, you became, at least in my eyes, and I know in a lot of other people's minds in the state of Missouri, the go-to person about autism. You might have not been the expert, but you knew who to ask to get the information disseminated. Didn't you also have your hand in some Missouri legislation about autism? Yes, um, I actually did some um, advocating. Well, the entire seven years that, that I published the magazine, I was connected up in Jeff City. And we would have advocacy days, autism awareness days. So we would usually go up two or three times a year. And we would, I was, I got to be in the middle of the planning of that. And it was so much fun. We would put together baskets to take around to the legislators and the moms would come and meet the, the senators and talk to them about their concerns. And these moms and dads with kids that have autism, they absolutely rock our world. I mean, they care, they know how to get the job done and they will be down there in person doing whatever it takes to fight for whatever they need for their kids. They do a great job. It's a wonderful publication. And Thanks. even if you're not in print anymore, it will live on. And it it was a newsletter that blossomed into a full-fledged magazine. Exactly. But can you speak to the fact of how newsletters can help a business grow? Absolutely. And, and in fact, that's I have prepared a handout for your listeners today that kind of speaks to that a little bit. But as I was preparing to do the Autism Report magazine, when I first went in, I really didn't know that much about it. By talking to people, I knew, I knew writing, I knew journalism, I knew how to do that. So by talking to people and learning about it and having other people weigh in, it began to make me look like the authority on autism, where I'm just a journalist that is writing about autism. If I were a person that had a company that, I don't know, an HVAC company, we're going to go with an HVAC company. And I want you know, my customers to know how to clean out their vents or how often to clean out their vests and they wonder why it won't work. So I'm going to send out a newsletter and part of that's going to be time to clean out your vents. Do you remember to do this and this and this and this? If you don't like to clean out your vents, we have a monthly or a, a, a quarterly program where we will come out and clean your vents. So you can tell people how to do it, which gives them value. You need your newsletter to give value. And then you offer to help them if if they can't do it themselves, because there's always those people that can't do it themselves, but then they understand the importance of it. So that's one of the things that a newsletter can do. But the more you send out a newsletter that has that value in it, the more your customers are going to look at you as the expert on in your area of expertise. In my experience, it seems like, hey, I don't really know if people are listening or reading. Right. But they are, you know. They, yes. They really are. And, and, you know, if I'm reading, one of the things I love to get when I get a newsletter is links. You know, there is one that comes out and I read it every time. And here's why. The very first one I got, it gave me 25 different it gave me a link to 25 different publishing houses that were accepting non-agented books because almost all of the publishers now expect you to have an agent. And, you know, there's value in having an agent, but it also costs money. So I was so excited to get 
these names of publishers that I might look at if I don't want to get an agent or can't get an agent, but still want to be traditionally published. When you give value like that, then a person begins to say, wow, I'm going to see what they've got this week or this month. And they will definitely click on your, on your newsletter to see what value you have to give them. Absolutely. And there's different formats. There's e-newsletters and there's value to direct mail newsletters. And the greatness about an e-newsletter, I mean, some people, you know, are more digital than others, but e-newsletters, you get data from it, but right. it's kind of hard to do that with uh, uh, direct mail, but there's still value. Yes. There, it, there is a, a cost financially so if somebody wants to send out a newsletter and they just do not have the money, then digital is the way to go. Send it in an email and you, your company may grow to the point where you can send out you know, a newsletter or a coupon card or a sale card, or you, know, you, you can afford those mailers then that go out to your readers. So it is a way that you can build that. If you start digital and then you get to the point where you can afford to send out the mailers because there is great value in those as well. Now, right now you're kind of going through a rebirth. I am. I am. I'm so excited. And you've published back in, what was it, 2001? Yes. You published your first book? I did. I did. And actually it was published by Rod and Staff Publishers. So the other little thing about me that is maybe as interesting or more interesting than having eight children is that I was uh, in the Mennonite church for 17 years. And uh, so my, my many of my children were raised mostly in the Mennonite church. While I was there, I began writing a book and it was accepted by Rod and Staff Publishers, which is a Mennonite publisher. And so they are, it's still out there for sale. It was translated into Spanish. And so there is a Spanish version and an English version. The Spanish version has outsold the English version. It, it took off great guns. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. So now after Missouri Autism Report and through right now your, your rebirth, you're pursuing your passion as writing as a Christian author. Yes. Why don't you tell us about your current project? I would love to. I'm so excited about it. Right now, I am writing a historical biography slash black history, and uh, which is kind of odd because I am not black. I am white, but I attend black church and they actually, they're the ones that kind of helped me through some of the hardest part of that struggle after the divorce. And just, I endeared myself to them and them to me. They are very special to me. And through that, I met this gentleman who was, he is the, his great, great grandparents were slaves. And then he was raised in the deep South as a sharecropper. Uh, and then eventually he marched with Martin Luther King Jr. And his story is riveting. It's fascinating. I am gripped every time I talk to the man. He tells me something else. And I'm like scribbling. I'm like, wait a minute. I got to get this. I got to record it. Hold on. <laughs> so anyhow, I'm writing a children's book to start with because I feel it's very, very important for our young people to understand history. And I think a lot of history has been not taught. This man's story is very raw and real. It lets us see something that maybe we didn't experience or don't understand and helps us to understand it a little better. And I think that's what we all need as humans is to begin to understand each other so that we can work together for the betterment of everyone. But the underlying story is his spiritual journey is just beautiful in this book. So I'm so excited to share that with with the world. So that's what I'm working on right now. Do you have a publish date set? I don't. And quite honestly, I haven't even gone out and looked for a publisher yet. I've got some in mind that I'm going to approach with this, with this book. I just finished a really, really good draft of it. If I can say that I've been working on it for a long time, but then I just, I took about four days and I went on a writing retreat and just hammered it down and got the editing done. Something that I feel really good about. And then when I brought it home and, and read it, I said, 
you know, I need to add this and I need to add that, you know, it, it just, there's a few more pieces I need to add in there before it's ready to send out to editors and then to beta readers. And I'm still deciding whether I might self-publish, you know, for seven years, I published a magazine. So self-publishing is definitely a possibility. So right now you are starting over. It's, it's being a, a Christian author, you're self-branding and it's like a whole new business. It really is because, you know, I did not take any sort of stand when I was publishing the Autism Report magazine. It was strictly autism and there was, you know, just, it was everything. And, and, you know, there were organizations that I was working with and would uh, share their information and that kind of thing. So, you know, it wasn't one side or the other. It was just, it was just informational. Where now, because I am a Christian and because I feel very strongly about sharing Christ with others and helping people on their journey. <laughs> I, I have this in my mind. Once I get done with this, I'm going to write a book called How Not to Fail Your Job Test. <laughs> because I kind of feel like everybody goes through a job test. Mine was my divorce period, where you are tested as far as you can go. It's like, I don't know that I can go any further and not break. And that is when you really find out what you're made of and what you need to do to make it through life and be as strong as you can be. So someday I'm going to write that book as soon as I'm done with these books. But um, so I've got a list. There's a list of books that I'm going to, to attack once I'm done with this. But right now I'm very passionate about what I'm doing. Well, is there any correlation or anything that you learned from growing uh, the Missouri Autism Report that you've implemented now in your new personal branding journey? Yes, actually, I'm sending out newsletters now. I've been quite busy with a couple of projects that I took on. I, I'm an alderman in our little town, and that takes way more time than I expected it to this year. And so that, you know, that's kind of gets me sidetracked occasionally with that. But as much as possible, I'm sending out newsletters to let people see the journey of writing this book. Um, we went to Memphis and we uh, visited this gentleman that I'm writing about. He and his wife, we spent a wonderful week with them. They just kind of wiped out their calendar and spent that week with us. They even got the room uh, next to ours at the hotel and we just hung out together. It was just wonderful. Uh, went to Beale Street, and he took us to see the church where he was baptized and just various sites around in Memphis. So I'm taking a lot of that as well as information that I'm learning on this journey and putting it into newsletters and sending those out to my readers. The list is growing. I sadly did not save my list from, you know, I, I had all those emails, a couple of thousand, uh, may have been closer to 3,000 emails that I sent information to about the autism report. And when I closed that, I did not keep it. And so I'm having to rebuild my contact list. But at the same time, it's, it's different. It's still you, but it's a little bit different. So you're, you're doing it to grow your list organically for right. people that are truly interested in you, your books, your message. That is awesome. Right. Yeah, it, it's exciting. It really is. And I've met so many wonderful people. I'm, I'm just excited about the journey. What has been your biggest challenge when growing a business? Oh, biggest challenge. I would say probably at this point, either the, the marketing part, even though I, I have a pretty good handle on it because I had to market the autism report. And like you said, you learn one thing in one area and you take that knowledge with you and you use it again. So I have a lot of, of understanding of the marketing. I think the part that scares me the most is the idea of, because I'm not a numbers person, handling the taxes and the 501c3, not 501, I did that. The, um, I did that with the autism report, the um, LLC and all of those things, just that business sense. But thankfully my husband has a pretty good business sense. So I'm probably going to just hand that over to him and say, here, honey, you take care of that. <laughs> Guide me, honey. Guide me. Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, that, you know, we can't be experts in everything. And right. 
getting that support in that that area and you being as creative as you are i mean you have a great business sense as well but i'm going to be uh bias i think maybe all those numbers would stifle your creativity <laughs> Right, exactly, exactly. Because I've just never been a numbers person. And in the same way, to me, I think growth is best one on one. And in all of my work, like with the church and that kind of thing, it's always been kind of a personal one on one type of relationship where, you know, I've taught Sunday school classes, but I always enjoy those small one on one classes where you just really can share and grow and and become friends. I enjoy that. So it, it's it's even hard for me to think about I need these big numbers on my email list because I'm a very much a one-on-one -on -one person. I want to know every person on that list, you know. So far, I do, but pretty soon it's going to outgrow me. <laughs> it it will and it uh, it's always interesting when your list grows bigger than what you know one-on-one. -on -one. If you go to an event and somebody ha happens to already follow you, they already know you and you have no, you don't know them. It's, it's weird, but uh, also very satisfying. It is satisfying. It is. Well, what's been your biggest reward? I think probably having an impact on people. Like you were talking about, you go someplace and people say, oh, aren't you Dana Alt? And you wrote that book, right? And I've been having that journey most of my life, which is fun. Usually I can go incognito and people don't know who I am. But once in a while, they say, didn't you used to publish the Missouri Autism Report magazine? Or didn't you write this book? And that I, I guess when they say things like, that helps me. I can't wait until it comes every month. Or, you know, I read that book and it was just such a help to me. Those are the things that I think making an impact is, is so, so important to me. That's what I love. Hey, Dana, can you share a favorite resource or a book that has really made a difference for you, either personally or professionally? Yes. And I, I actually wrote it down. I'm going to find it here. Give me just one minute. Here it is. Okay. So I have two written down that I have really enjoyed. And, and there are a lot of things that I could tell you about because I'm, I'm always educating myself. I'm always listening to books. I'm an audiobook person. But I think when I first began, this is uh, on the topic of what I'm writing about right now. When I first began learning, I found out there was a whole lot I didn't know. And I read the book, The Lies My Teacher Told Me by James Lowen. He's wordy, his books are very thick, you have to hang in there through it. But that book was so, in fact, I gave it to my son and I said, this summer, you're reading this book because this is everything you did not learn in your history classes. Because there's just so much that is not presented, not given, or that the, the people that write the history books just have like glazed over. And I really enjoyed that because I wasn't a good history student. And all of a sudden I'm just devouring history and thinking, wow, I never knew that. So I think that was topically would be uh, my favorite book. I would say everybody needs to hear, read or listen to that book craft book right now I'm doing um, Save the Cat Writes a Novel, which is a way of writing. It's a, a, a theory is not the right word, but it is, it, it's a book on crafting uh, a book. Yes, yes, a lot of technique. It talks about plot and character development, but the way that they do it just hit me as being so, so helpful. So I'm going through that right now. It's written by Jessica Brody. And it's called Save the Cat Writes a Novel. And it's so good. <laughs> well, I'll definitely have the, the links in the show notes as well as uh, your book's links so that folks can uh, find your publications as well. Excellent. Thank you. How can we stay in touch with you and follow you? Okay. So my website is very simple. It's just Dana Alt. Dot com And I'm Dana with a Y, so it's D-A-Y-N-A, -A, last name A-U-L-T, dot com. Uh, I made it really easy. Uh, I'm on Facebook, 
uh, at Dana Alt Writer. And then um, my email is dana.alt.author at gmail.com. And I'll have everything uh, in the show notes for a quick link. I'd love for you guys listening out there to stay in touch with Dana. Yes, that would be wonderful. I would I would love to hear from, from your listeners. That would be great. Well, thanks so much for being here with me today. Gayla, thank you. This has been so much fun, and it's so good to see you again. Good to see you. Well, thanks for joining me today. What was your biggest takeaway from Dana's journey? Join the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group and join in the conversation. We'd love to hear what inspired you from Dana's story. Again, go over to the Live Full Work Fun Facebook group. The link is right there in the show notes. And share any ideas that sparked for you. All of Dana's information and contacts and her books and the recommendations are all linked right there in the show notes. So remember that. Well, thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. How about sharing this episode with one friend that you think would find it inspiring and helpful? If you're feeling extra generous, I'd love for you to leave a review. Again, thanks for listening. Until next time, have a fantastic week. Live full and work fun.